beauty. Beautiful. The word beautiful at the turn of the 20th century was really synonymous with a great grand architectural movement, which I'm sure you know, City Beautiful. City Beautiful espoused that if you, if you built these grand monumental spaces, it would bring out the higher nature of the people. The first place we saw it was at the Chicago Exposition, the Columbia Exposition in Chicago in 1893. We also saw it with the plan at the Washington Mall. And in Philadelphia, the proponents of City Beautiful almost demanded that there be a great parkway. And, and eventually, it became the Ben Franklin Parkway. Now, around the 1900, 1890s, the founders of the, what would become the Interborough Rapid Transit, which was the first subway, the planners by 1900, they were plans to build. And they, they proposed, they brought into City Beautiful. They felt that if we created great public spaces, then the people that took the subway, then it would bring out the better nature. So they included in the contract to build this line. And I'm going to read that to you. The railway and its equipment, as contemplated by the contract, constitute a great public work. All, all parts of the structure where exposed to public sight shall therefore be designed, constructed, and maintained with an eye to the view, with the view to the beauty of their appearance as well as to their efficiency. And it was. The, the architects were Heinz and Lafarge. And it was their job to bring this beauty to the subway. We saw it at City Hall, 1904, when it opened. The architects also knew that if you were going to bring people down into the subway that were used to traveling above ground, then you were going to have to make it beautiful. We saw terracotta by the finest terracotta makers. These are Gruby of Boston. We saw their, their cobalt blue glazes at Bleecker and their groovy green that they became so famous for at Columbus Circle. Now, we also saw that they used associative symbols. So at Columbus Circle, you had the caravel below. And at Astor Place, the Astor family who had made their money in the fur trading business, you have the beaver. Now, this, this philosophy would move also into the next phase of building, into the 1918s. And they would carry it forward of creating these beautiful spaces. In some ways, it carried into the, to the 30s when the system was built to take people to 1939 to the World's Fair, but in a, in a much more modernist, a contemporary uh, aesthetic, if you will. Things would change, though, and the automobile would become king. And the, the belief in, in transit became old-fashioned and unfashionable. And there would be a, a tremendous decline in transit. You can see here. You can see how the system was deteriorating and little to no investment. Eventually, it was on the brink of collapse. This is what the rolling stock looked like. And of course, ridership plummeted. So by the early 1980s, the system was pretty much devastated. But there was a belief, a belief in leadership, the MTA, that they believed they could turn it around. And they went forward doing so. They also had the amazing foresight that if they included art in this rebuilding program, then it would create a beautiful spaces. It would also 
deter graffiti. So we have Astor Place. This is what Astor Place looked like before. And then after, Milton Glaser included porcelain enamel murals into the station restoration. The MTA also went forward in a, in a very organized way. They had design guidelines, guidelines that were based on many different aspects to be sort of streamlined. One of those was color. And the color were based in the beginning in the early stations, they were based on the historic mosaics. In the later stations, on bolder colors that they had originally been built, charts that they had been built according to. And the modernist would be also very bold, but a clean, crisp aesthetic. What we saw very early on was that if you included art, it would change these, these places. It made the, the aesthetic, the, the places became a different place. Arts for Transit also looked at, at the historic terracotta. We saw where neither man nor nature had intervened, the terracotta was in remarkably good shape. And we, we made note of that. We also noted bronze and other elements that, that were durable. And we knew in our environment that it would have to be durable. It would have to be easily maintained. We also had a lot of wall space, miles and miles, hundreds of miles, if not thousands of miles of walls. So it was only, it was only natural that you would include walls. You, you should incorporate your art into this architecture, and it should become part, integrated to this whole of the space. So, oh, 27 years later, we have over 20, 240 artworks, permanent artworks, installed in the MTA. That's Subway, Long Island Railroad, Metro North. So where you had, before there was a dreary station, now you had these beautiful mosaics by Elizabeth Murray. Elizabeth used stepping shoes and steaming coffee cups to create beauty. In many ways, she's evoking that, that morning and evening commute. Now, when you think of New York, you think of Times Square most often, or very often. And Roy Lichtenstein created a mural in porcelain enamel that's really become, it's called Times Square Mural, it's become, in many ways, the icon of Arts for Transit. And it's very much on its way to become the icon for New York City transit. Jane Dixon created revelers also at Times Square. And of course, we all know about the celebration at New Year's Eve. Well, Jane knows that every day, someone somewhere in Times Square is celebrating. <laughs> Al Hell created passing through that really evoked the, the sky sky rises and the architecture in, a, in an abstract way above. Sam Kuntz created Under Bryant Park. It's a view as if you're looking out under Bryant Park and you see the root outcroppings, you see the roots as well as the stones, and you see quotations that are, are on these pipes that reflect above the New York Public Library. Now, at 81st Street on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, you have the Museum of Natural History. Below, at, at 81st Street, it's as if when you get off the train, it's as if you're, you're in the museum. There are dioramas, there, the, the art there reflects what is above in the, in the museum. At 59th on the west, west side, Saul LeWitt created his Whirls and Twirls MTA to really respond to the energy of the place. Using very durable materials, his work, it's bright and bold, 
and it captures the spirit of the people as they are traveling through. Tom Otterness's Life Underground at 14th Street, his tubby toy like fi uh, figures uh, capture your imagination. And so much so that he even plays on that, that urban myth of the alligator. Now, just to show you sort of what beauty can do, Andrea, including art, Andrea Dezzo's community garden at Bedford Lehman is it's just a great example of how different this space feels now. It's not just mosaic, though. We also have included functional works that, that are in the windscreen, and yet they're also sculpture. In this case, Barbara Gregudis opens up the view to the community, to the river, to the park below. At Atlantic Avenue, John D. Domenico, architect, worked with Alan and Ellen Wexler to create a scenic overlook. And it really plays off of that concept of the national park, where you're looking out, except in this case, you're looking out over the urban environment. When you arrive at Coney Island, you see the cyclone, you see the waves of the Atlantic Ocean, and now you see a station that evokes the same sort of feeling. Once again, before you really could not look out and see the ocean, you could not see nature, but now this is Vito Acconci and HDR, HDR architects have created almost like an eye so that you can look out and now that nature is open to you. At Stillwell Avenue, Coney Island, the performance internationally known performance artist Robert Wilson created a 370-foot glass wall. He used historic images from postcards to capture that moment of the heyday of Coney Island. Architect John D. Domenico did the same thing, but architecturally, and he also included, this is the portal building at Coney Island, he also included the historic terracotta into the architecture. Very recently, we installed Leo Villarreal's hive, and it is at a location that was always been cut off. You could not transfer from the, on the 6th from uptown to downtown, and now you can, and you can not only transfer, there's this wonderful piece of artwork that you can find the location very easily. Now, it's not just art that changes a place. It's also, it's all the elements. And in particular, when you're, you're putting into the environment an element of industrial design. That has to be part of this place, not just an anomaly. So, Antenna Design created vending machines when we, when we introduced our Metro card. And this past year at the Museum of Modern Arts Talk to Me show, the, museum, the machine was on display. And Antenna Design, they're from Cranbrook. Um, <laughs> Antenna Design created this help point that's now being installed. Would you believe? It is in the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art. And it's on display if you get a chance to see it. Now, we're building, we're not just restoring, we're also building some new stations. This is the 2nd Avenue subway, and I'm going to give you a little sneak preview on what's going to be there. Chuck Close, it's larger than life portraits, are going to, to greet you at, at 86th Street. Sarah C the United States entry to the Venice Biennale this year will have these her force fields at three different entrances at 96th Street. And Jean Shen at the 63rd Street connector, Jean has taken that concept or where the, where the elevated trains once were and when they were re removed, light came streaming down. She's taken that concept and bringing it forward now marking that now, finally, we have a Second Avenue subway. Zenobia Bailey is creating these large, colorful mandalas 
that will be in the new 7 West station. Now, nowhere was there beauty was needed more than in lower Manhattan after 9-11. The artists, the Starn twins, Mike and Doug, created these stainless steel, laser-cut fences that, that really evoked the park above the battery. They also included, they, they're photographers, as you know, and they included this glass wall, glass brick wall, that took their photography and, again, brought those trees in the battery above down into the station. At the Fulton Transit Center, we're working with artist Jamie Carpenters, working with Grimshaw Architects, and they've created an oculus that will bring light down into this space. And the, Jamie has created a cable net. The light's going to come down and hit this cable net. It's going to, it's going to ref, pop down onto the floor and almost dance like magic. Now, you may be wondering, what, what did the MTA get out of this? What, what did it do for the MTA? Well, we now have seven and a half million riders every workday on the subway. We have another half a million on the commuter lines. And that is an amazing thing that this many people's lives are affected by the beauty that's coming into this system. This past spring, we launched our Arts for Transit app. And when we launched it, Randy Kennedy, the art critic for the New York Times, wrote, the most underrated art museum in New York City is the subway system. Did you hear that? The most underrated. I'm sorry, I have to say this again. <laughs> the most underrated art museum in New York City is the subway system. Now, that's a beautiful thing. So I'm going to invite you to connect with us on our website, to join our journey, to follow us on Tumblr, to like us on Facebook, <laughs> to follow us on Twitter, and please download our app so that you follow this journey with the collection of Arts for Transit at your fingertips. Thank you.